You're watching The Luke Bryan Show. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. It's The uh, Luke Bryan Show. I'm Luke Zacharias. I'm a lawyer here in uh, Chilliwack and Abbotsford. And I'm Brian Vickers. I'm a lawyer in Abbotsford. And today, our guest is John Ford. John is a friend of mine. I've been friends for many years, and John has a very interesting story. So we're going to hear a bit about John today. So welcome, John. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah. So tell me a bit about your uh, your childhood, John. You grew up in Agassiz, I think. And uh, wow. what was that like? You know, it was great. Um, growing up in a small town, you don't really... We didn't have a chance to get into trouble, I'd put it that way. We were into sports. And uh, had a wonderful group of friends that are still my friends today. And I was just texting with them this morning, actually. And it's just the, the memories from there, living on a farm, having horses, getting to watch my dad, who was a cowboy, be a cowboy. Yeah. You know, just that was kind of, a, I don't know, a great way to grow up. I never thought of it as a small town. Yeah. Yeah. What, what kind of sports did you play? Well, basketball first. Um, we, I was very fortunate to be with a group of guys. We won the provincials two years in a row. From Agassiz. From Agassiz. <laughs> That's not easy to do. That probably not happened many no, times. I think our second one, we may have gone like oh, 28 and 0. Like it was, it was extraordinary. I was very fortunate. We were all very fortunate to have great teammates and good coaches. And, um, and we all played together. There's nothing to do. So you just play basketball after school, during school, lunch hour, every time you get a chance. And then I was introduced to track and field by um, a wonderful PE teacher I had in grade six, I think. And uh, I did well. I was a thrower. I would have thought you'd be like a long distance runner. <laughs> <laughs> no, there are jokes about that. But <laughs> we would throw things at them. No. Okay. no uh, I was not a long distance runner, as you can imagine. I tried sprinting once, but that didn't work very yeah, well yeah. either. Um, you you know things like javelin, discus? And I threw them all. Yeah. Hammer, shot put. Uh, hammer was so shot put discus started, and then I was introduced to the hammer. And uh, uh, long story short, I, I basically my coach said it's better to be good at one than pretty good at three. So I dropped the shot and discus, and I went on to be. Um, I was ranked number one in North America as a junior athlete. So I had a I had a really great time in that. I got yeah. to travel with the national team and uh, and just meet wonderful people and amazing coaches and managers and. What was the training like to get to be number one? Seven days a week. That was, you know, my parents were amazing. They said um, there was no pressure to work because my mom said, well, that is your job. And they knew that if you did that, you would have options. And I didn't think about that. But, of course, you know, I was offered a full-ride scholarship at SFU and, and multiple schools in the States that I didn't go to because I was, you know, I didn't want to leave home. I didn't want to leave the legacy. Yeah. Um, but I did go to SFU until I was injured there. But as a hammer discus thrower, that's basically what I did um, leaving Agassiz. But the training was seven days a week, four days a week with an amazing guy named Harold Willers who needs a mention because in this town of Chilliwack, Harold is huge. He's probably taught almost everybody who's ever lived here as a math teacher and been a mentor to many people, and he's just a wonderful man. Um, he was my weightlifting coach and friend and mentor all through those years. Um, you know, it's funny, I, I've trained young guys and, and I really got to get out of my head because they're like, oh, I lifted, you know, 225 today in my squat. And I say, well, how old are you? Well, I'm 18. I said, oh, I did that when I was, well, 12. I did, I did 495 <laughs> when I was 17. But that's because I had such great coaches. They didn't put these limitations on me. It was like, and I was not, we got to be clear, I was not the strongest guy by any means. There were other guys way stronger. But I had great, such great mentors and coaches that they didn't limit my goals and my dreams. And they didn't talk about, oh, well, you can't do that or you can't do that. And, and I think there's a bit more of that today, like expectations of what you should and shouldn't be able to do. And it limits a lot of people. So I'm lucky I didn't have that. So, so that uh, that's an interesting concept, not limiting your your kind of potential. How do you think that's influenced you throughout your life, that way of thinking? Oh, it's everything. What do you yeah. mean by that? Uh, what the mind can conceive and the heart will believe you will achieve. It's written on my wall. It's written on my vision board. It's written everywhere. Yeah. And so... and. I have I, I, everything I wanted. I just go get it. And, and that sounds super cocky, but it's true. I, 
I don't know, I, uh, my, the businesses, I have vision boards for those, for the place I live, for my sauna, for my cold plunge, like all the things I want in my life, I just put it on the board, make a plan, go get it, no limitations. Yeah. And Is that where that thought kind of way of thinking came from was from those coaches or actually came from my brother yeah my brother went to a tony robbins seminars back in the 80s and i remember it. remember tony yeah, I, I got to meet tony a couple times wonderful man and he's all that he, he is a, he has giantism oh, okay yeah, yeah zacromegaly yeah yeah, yeah. It's a, he's, a, he's a rare person that's larger than you he yeah. is <laughs> <laughs> i remember standing behind him at one of the canucks games looking up going it's Tony. Yeah. I'm right behind. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and you know, I, I'm going to skip to that real quick. I uh, tapped him on the shoulder and I thanked him because my brother had been to a seminar, come home, shared with us. Then my, my mom and dad and myself, can you imagine? I was yeah. 17, maybe 16, 17, I think. We did a 30-day Tony Robbins tape seminar, wrote out all our goals, my yeah. goals. Yeah. They all came true, my five-year goals. It was crazy. So I here I am at 22 working for the Canucks, standing behind Tony Robbins, this guy that I listened to on tape. So I tapped him on the shoulder and I said, I just want to thank you. The anthem was playing. I do remember that. That was it, probably inappropriate, but <laughs> <laughs> too bad. I, uh, I took that moment and he said, uh, John, it was nice to meet you. I have to run and work with the team. He was working with the LA Kings and we were playing them that night. And so... I let it go. Of course, it was wonderful. I thanked him. I said, my brother was influenced. And I don't remember what else I said. After the game, I'm stacking tape and getting ready to leave in our training room. And I get a tap on my shoulder. And it's Tony Robbins. And he's like, John, it was great to meet you. And I have no idea what he said because yeah. I was just dumbfounded that he came and found me. But yeah. this is what he does. Five years later, I'm at a wedding at a hotel. I'm a best man at a wedding. Tony's in the hotel doing the fire walk, and we had a break, so I thought, I'm going to go see if I can find him. So I did. He's putting his socks back on after the fire walk and sitting backstage, and I said, hey, Tony. He looked up, and he said, hey, the guy from the Canucks, how you doing? And I thought, now that's impressive. Yeah. That he... Remembered that. Out of ugh, millions of people, yeah, this guy yeah, gets contact yeah. with. So I have a lot of respect for people who have that. You know, we're a little weird, yeah. right? But you have that ability to remember and, I don't know, just, just give something of yourself, right? You also have a way of leaving an impression on people in a short oh, period of time. Huge. Yeah. yeah, huge. So let, let's circle back a bit. Yeah. We kind of jumped ahead. But yeah. so the national track team, that was a part mm. of your life. So mm. tell, walk us through that. And I th understand you became the captain of that team at some point. I so did, yeah. Walk yeah. us through how, what that journey looked like. That was wonderful. It was the, the first team was the junior national team. So we were 18 and under. Um, we got to travel, you know, a fair amount, a lot of training uh, across Canada. Then uh, we had dual meets with um, countries like Japan, Australia, Jamaica, the U.S., of course, uh, Germany, Russia. Got to meet a lot of great athletes. Um, got to compete against people that were just phenomenal. I remember this Cuban thrower that just destroyed me, and I was so happy to be destroyed by someone so good. This guy was just incredible. Technically, he was perfect. I remember he was throwing high 60-meter throws when we were all throwing 58 meters, maybe. It was just incredible. Yeah. Um, so impressive moments. Uh, lots of amazing friends I still have to this day. Uh, I would recommend it to any child. What about travel? I mean, you must travel all over the world playing for the, the Nationals. Um, so, you know, to be honest, I, I was injured before Pan Am Games, and um, I was injured before the 92 Olympics. Uh, all, all, pretty much all my friends made it. I, I don't know if I would have made the team. The standards were very high in throwing, so to be fair, I would have had to throw uh, further than I had thrown yet twice that year to make that a standard but i got injured um in 1990 so it, right in the midst of training for those commonwealth games same thing injured before those um but uh my main traveling was really just in north america yeah i the commonwealth games i think that year were down in um well i can't remember maybe new zealand or something but yeah, yeah still, it's the whole country. You get to see, a kid and, yeah, yeah, and and adult, but and yeah, and really young adult, and and being um, 
you know, you're, you're meeting all sorts of ethnicities as well from all these different countries and listening to different languages and coming from a small town of Agassiz. That's wonderful uh, to because we we think we know so much and we don't know anything when you you hear all these languages and meet yeah. these wonderful people. Yeah. So, okay, that takes us kind of to the end of high school. What What's next mm. in John's journey? Oh, the end of high school. So I um, um, I went on to SFU. And uh, that was that was a, a that was an okay experience. I did get injured, um, so I'm a bit of a dancer. Unfortunately, <laughs> I was dancing. I tried to do the splits, tore my groin. <laughs> so it wasn't an injury that I'm proud of. And in fact, you know, years later, as a therapist, I was working with an athlete, and this athlete was from SFU. And I said, "Oh, I went to SFU." And I said, "But I hurt myself. I tore my groin." And they went, "Wait, what?" You're the guy. You're not the guy. <laughs> <laughs> the, the basically got redshirted because he went dancing at UBC. I'm like, oh, they still tell the story. <laughs> so the AD still used me as an example. Yeah. yeah. Of what not to do. What not to do. So what happened there is when you redshirt, um, you, you, as an athlete, you kind of lose interest in, in the schoolwork because the schoolwork does, you know, it's kind of second in your mind. And um, so re- I, I couldn't compete, basically because of my injury. So I uh, left and I went to the West Coast College of Massage Therapy to take my sports training as a therapist. Some people may not know what a red shirt is. So you have a certain amount of years of eligibility and then if you red shirt, it extends it by a year. That's essentially That's right. it. So you take a year off essentially due to injury and extends it. So they, they expect you to stay. What, yeah. I never, I've never asked you this question before. Yeah. What were you studying at uh, SFU oh. before you went to the RMT school? Kinesiology. Okay. Um, French. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, one gr- uh, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I had uh, one great French teacher and one absolutely atrocious French yeah. teacher. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll say that lots of times over. She was terrible. So the uh, massage therapy school, where is that located? Uh, it, it is now in, uh, I think it's in New West now. Yeah. Yeah. At the time, it was right downtown on Main Street, yeah. Main and Kiefer. Yeah. Um, it was very interesting every day, whether you're screamed at with people with knives or, uh, you know, as an 18-year-old, 19-year-old guy going to school, walking down Main, um, stepping around and over people and, you know, Finding a whole new part of life from Agassiz yeah. to downtown Vancouver, very different. So the next part of your story I love because I grew up as a huge Canucks fan and just uh, followed them every game. And, <laughs> and you got to work for the Canucks right out of I school. Sure and, so, and this is like, this is like, you know, the prime era of Trevor Lynn and Pavel oh. Burry, the Canucks going to the finals in 94. Tell, tell us about that, that experience. Yeah, it was 1993 and I was um, Saturday morning laying in bed and the phone rang and I was woken up by this. So I pick up the phone. And it's um, a trainer for the Canucks, who I didn't know at the time. Yeah. And he said, uh, it's John Ford. And I said, yeah. He said, uh, would you like to come and work for the Canucks? <laughs> and I kind of thought, what? <laughs> and and uh, he, I, he said, that's a trainer. Would you like to come? We need a trainer. Would you like? To? And I said, no, I can't. I've got patience. I, I can't do that. And then I hung up. Yeah. I said goodbye. <laughs> 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 and then... My wife said, what was that? And I said, oh, I just got offered a job to work for the Canucks. And she said, what? I said, exactly. That was weird. And I could, then I really woke up and I yeah. thought, oh, my God, what was that? Phone rang again. And, and he said, hey, John, it's uh, Dave from the Canucks. I said, oh, hi. He said, I'm going to ask you one more time. <laughs> do you want to work for the Canucks? I said, yes, I do. <laughs> I guess. I, he said, I thought you were still sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I joined the team, and you know the first day was amazing. The stories are incredible. Um, Pat Quinn was just another father, right? He's yeah. just an awesome man. Yeah. Did and, you smoke cigars with him? Or? Um, with Rick Lee a little bit. <laughs> okay. I don't like cigars, but okay. I I did try. Yes, yes. Rick, I Rick and I would. Rick Lee was the assistant coach, yeah, and he yeah. we would go to all the um, away games together. He Rick would drive me in his car to the airport. It was just one of the things we did. And he was always smoking a cigar, even in the car. Yeah. But uh, first day I come in, I get to meet Pat. But I figure I would, you know, I would put on my Canadian tracksuit and look like an athlete. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that's the smart thing to do, <laughs> right. right? Problem is Canadian tracksuit is is red, white, and yellow. <laughs> yeah. And Pat Quinn walks over and goes, what is the... He, 
Who is this? He says, he's got the Calgary Flames colors on. Get him a suit now. <laughs> so they got me a suit and, uh, and never put the other one on again. Yeah, yeah. 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 Just a wonderful way to start a day. I, I got to meet, uh, first day I met all the guys. And they really do treat you very well as a trainer mm-hmm. because you are helping them. You're, You're the taking best care of their bodies. Really which are. is how they make their money. Yeah. So I can't say enough good things about Trevor Linden and... Yeah. Gino Ojek, and I miss, you know, we lost Gino, and um, so many great stories. They would take me out every night. Yeah. didn't matter what city we were in. You know, the question would come, hey, Johnny, what are you doing for dinner? And I would be working and say, I, I haven't thought about that. Well, you're coming with us, and yeah. they'd take you to a restaurant where you walk in, and it's nothing but movie stars in L.A. or just a fantastic view of the ocean in another city. Uh, just, just fantastic people. Yeah. Yeah. So... That was a shorter part of your journey. Now, I know somewhere in here you go and do Highland Games, so I can't, I can't remember where we that should, fits. We should back up because I do have one good story about okay. my Canucks experience okay, I, that, yeah. that I have to include my wife on, and I tell a lot of people this, and they get a kick out of it. So Wayne Gretzky, I, I got to meet and work with Wayne like four different times because, of course, I was a trainer for the Canucks, but I was also the one that would help the opposing team when they're in town. So if they needed something, I would run it over to them. Yeah. But, and Wayne Gretzky is just a phenomenal human yeah. uh, to other people. And so by about the third time I ran into him, he said, hey, John, anything you need, you just let me know. I won't mm-hmm. sign anything. And so as a result, I never did ask him because I, I had too much respect for him. But one day, we're waiting to go for lunch, and it's myself and Pavel Burry and Wayne Gretzky and a two other trainers standing in this little area waiting to leave, not together, separately. I get a door opens up and our laundry guy says, hey, Ford, your wife is here. Pick you up. So I say, okay, guys, we'll see you later. And Wayne Gretzky says, oh, John, I'd love to meet your wife. Because yeah. he's just that guy, right? Yeah. So I close the door, go out literally on the other side of the door, and there's my wife. And I say, Carmen, Wayne Gretzky wants to meet you. He's right in here. And she said, I don't have time for that. <laughs> the soup is on and it's going to burn. We got to go. <laughs> so I go back in. She leaves. I go back in. I said, wait. And I'm laughing now. I said, uh, soup's going to burn. <laughs> she doesn't want to meet you. I, we got to go. <laughs> and he said, I love her even more. She doesn't care who I am. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a moment I'll never forget. That's awesome. That's a great uh, yeah. story. You talk yeah. about Wayne Gretzky giving back and how much he does for the community. Mm. And uh, I ran into him one time when I was I was uh, I think I was busing or bartending at Cardero's, and he was there. I think with the Make a Wish Foundation, and and there must have been thirty kids and him uh, having lunch. And uh, yeah, it was it was pretty pretty cool to see somebody giving back that way. And and I and being able to witness him be honest and and just that guy all the time. He really is that guy. And Trevor's the same way. Just super nice people, you know. Anyway. So, yeah, so net, the Highland <laughs> Back Games. Back onto the Highland, yeah, oh, the Highland get, Games. Jump ahead a few years. Yeah. Um, I, uh, my wife wanted to travel. And, and like I think most people who are, I guess, entrepreneurial and maybe a little attention deficit, I can't go travel and do nothing. Yeah. Like that's really... That drive me crazy. So I said, well, if I had a reason to go, I could go somewhere. So she said, well, I want to go to Scotland. And I said, well, I was a thrower on the national team. I could probably do the Highland Games. Yeah. So I find a good friend who was at the time world champion caber thrower, which is the big telephone pole. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I said, Doug, would you train me? He said, absolutely. Yeah. So I trained and trained and trained, and then I won the Pacific Northwest Championships and qualified, and I went and competed as a professional Highland Games athlete in all over, at, like, all over Scotland. We did five different gigs over there. That was pretty fun. Yeah. yeah. What was the best part of that experience for you? Um, the kilts. Uh, well, I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I have. Oh, I still have my kilt. Oh, yes. Is it, is it a throwing kilt? <laughs> it's a it's a hunter kilt. That's okay. why it's green. So there's yeah. the red, which is your dress kilt, and your green yeah. is your hunter. Yes. And it's my it's my grandmother's McDonald yeah. family tartan. So, uh, yeah. Okay, the kilt. Because you're on TV in the SGA, the Scottish Games Association. You have to wear something underneath your kilt, just right. to just to dispel the myth. <laughs> and they literally check <laughs> because TV, Some guys don't. The cameras are there. Yeah, yeah. And at Braemar Games, the Queen always went. And some years earlier, 
a guy went to pick the caber, and when you pick the caber, you pull it up to here, but he caught his kilt in his fingers, <laughs> and he lifted his kilt, <laughs> and the queen was there, and the TV cameras were there, and he didn't have anything on. Yeah. And so after that day, they made a ruling yeah. that you must now wear something under your kilt. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the kilt was, was great. And, and you know what? If, have you ever worn a kilt? No. no. Well, then you should. It's wonderful. <laughs> I'm not exactly uh, Scottish. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <It'd be kind laughs> <of weird. laughs> uh, but no, it's it's heavy and it sways and it's just majestic almost, right? And when the pipes are playing and we're throwing, it is awesome. It's so much fun. Um, I think my best moment was in Edinburgh. The, the games are big there and you're in a stadium and so there might be 15,000 people watching, but most of them are tourists because they're going to watch something they don't get to see yeah so i wasn't going to compete in these games i was just going to watch them but i had my stuff with me and i walked down to the fence to say hi to one of the guys stephen king who was the world champion hammer thrower at the time and uh, i said hey stephen and he says what are you doing i said i'm just going to watch Oh, no. And he says, you get in here. So I, I get in there. I get all kilted up. And my poor wife is sitting now by herself in the stands. <laughs> yeah. And she's just filming me, probably cursing me out. And uh, they, they have an MC. And he's announcing to all these people, and, and he says, we've got another competitor. He's from Canada. <laughs> and big, you know. Yeah. And uh, then he says, let's see if he knows what he's doing. <laughs> so I pick up to warm up. I pick up this weight for distance, and I spin twice, and I throw it. And it goes like 90, 80, 85 feet. And everybody cheers. And this guy cheers. He knows what he's doing. And it's like all of a sudden Canada became the favorite place to cheer for. I'm not the winner of these events by any means. But every time I touched anything, the whole, all the Germans would, would cheer. It was so hilarious. Yeah. So there was a Caber event uh, at the end, but it was pouring rain. Caber was super heavy, 22 feet long, 200 and plus pounds, super heavy Caber. So you have to pick it up, run with it, stop, and try and flip it end over end. Yeah. Well, nobody could do it. I attempted twice. It slipped out of my hands. It was super rainy, bad. So the last throw, and the crowd is just wanting this so badly to watch someone yeah. turn this caver and pick it up. And so the, you basically run about 30 feet and then try and flip it. Yeah. And I'm in a stadium, and this crowd's there, and I, I get down, and I... I literally pray. I say, come on, just let me pick it up. That's all I want to do is just pick it up. I don't need to turn it. Yeah. I pick it up. And I've got this thing and my shoulders pushing and I'm bouncing and the crowd goes crazy. They're screaming because yeah. someone picked it up and I start running. Well, the more I ran, the more they cheered and I thought, oh, I'm just going to keep going. So I ran like 50 yards. <laughs> yeah. The longer I ran, the more they cheered and then it was like, eh, eh, and it fell down. It was nothing impressive. <laughs> and I get back and all the guys are like, where are you going? <laughs> Save her in the moment. That was it. That's all. My wife has pictures of me doing it all the way down. Yeah. Oh yeah, it was it was it was a it was a wonderful wonderful yeah. day. <laughs> so you come back from Scotland, and yeah. at some point you move out to back to the Fraser Valley, and and was that are we in the right place here? Or did we miss something? Um, I was already in the Fraser Valley uh, at at the Scottish Highland Games. I actually was introduced to the musical band that I played with. That was kind of the next transition into yeah. st stopping the games due to body pain you know you literally some of the weights for distance 56 pounds for distance with one hand you're throwing mm -hmm. it like 30 feet it's it's um it's really hard on the body yeah yeah basically the farmer's carry was the hardest one that's like a 400 pound carry for distance uh, so after two three years of that you just you're kind of done yeah that was, so that was another topic. You have a huge passion for music, so maybe it's a good se segue to, to music and yeah. how that passion developed. And I, I don't know if it was in Scotland. I've never asked you this before. It was at, actually at Highland Games in Langley that I... So I played music, um, like a lot of people do. And I played saxophone in band my whole life. And yeah. But I love it. And my dad was a musician, and my mom sang to me every night, you know, that kind of thing. It was really deep inside. And uh, I played guitar. And I started playing on our trip to Ireland and Scotland in 98 when I went to the Highland Games. I bought a couple of instruments there, some Gaelic Celtic instruments. And uh, I learned how to play the Irish Balron, which is a traditional drum. 
So I was at the Highland Games in Langley. I met a group called the Sabir Sisters. There were four sisters and a, a full band, and they played fiddle. And and um, they they found out that I played guitar, so they needed a rhythm guitarist. They asked me if I would come and audition. So I got there, and I said, I also play the baron. And they said, what? Because they didn't have that in yeah. the band. And, and when Great Big C was on back in the 90s, it was a yeah. big thing to have a baron. So... Um, I brought that along, and yeah, then I played with them for 10 years all yeah. over, big stages, uh, main stage at uh, Mountain Mer Merit Mountain Music Fest, yeah. and, um, a lot of fun playing music, and from there I um, kind of graduated to play piano and vocals and guitar and a little bit of everything. And I know you have this huge passion for following Bruce Springsteen. Is that oh. something that was from earlier, back like in Born oh, in the yeah. USA days, or was it? It all started because of Helen Whatmuff, a, a Australian exchange student living with us when I was, well, it was in 1985, yeah. because uh, Born in the USA came out, and she had like the headband and the white T-shirt, yeah, and, yeah. and I remember she had the album, and I said, "What's that?" Because I used to listen to my brother's albums. So lots of Billy Joel. And uh, she said, what's this you say? <laughs> and she said, you have you to listen. Don't do that. Yeah. No, no, you no, I don't. Scottish <laughs> 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 Throw another shrink from the Bobby. No, I don't do that. Uh, and she said, you have to listen to this. So she sat me down and I listened to Born the USA. And then um, at the time, my best buddy Greg and another friend Rob uh, we're huge into Springsteen too, and so it just really started to go. And actually, my friend Rob wrote a book about him. He he's a Random House author and kind of kind of cool. He wrote a Springsteen yeah. book. And yeah. And yeah, I've seen Bruce twenty times, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but most memorable probably went with my friend Phil to uh, Broadway. New York to watch him in front of just 800 people do his Broadway musical show it was amazing. Yeah. 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 So back to playing music. So yeah. you yourself, so you were in that band and then where's the music evolved since then? Well, I would say, um, I love, uh, I have a lot of, of artists who, who are friends and, um, I've been involved in music so much, uh, every, I've played with Riverdance, I've played with Ashley McIsaac, I've played with all these different people who I'm so fortunate to be able to play with. Um, I've, I've forgotten so many things I've done, but, you know, memories come back. At this point, I just like playing for myself. Yeah. I have a studio, I play a lot of piano. I love to play covers of songs I love and... I make everybody do karaoke when all the professional musicians come over. I have professional musician karaoke and yeah, force yeah. them into it. Did yeah. you pass that passion on to your kids? Uh, Hannah, she is quite a singer. And uh, I just found out Regan, um, she plays piano when we're not listening. I found some recordings on my phone and then she was playing a little bit in the house and it, she's great. Um, Declan is learning guitar right now. Good proud moments. Yeah, yeah. He loves... Uh, he loves uh, Zach Bryan, so he's playing a lot of, and he loves a few other of these country guys. So, how about Luke Bryan? Well, yeah, of course. <laughs> this is the Luke Bryan. This show. is the <laughs> Luke Bryan show. Different um, Luke Bryan. Yeah. <laughs> you guys are better. Yeah. <laughs> tell him that. I'll tell him that. Yeah. That's okay. I got no problem with that. Yeah. yeah. So I want to kind of change gears and yeah. talk about something a passion you and I have shared. Uh, in a big way is entrepreneurship and mm -hmm. growing businesses. So that's been a big part of your life as well. And, and so that's kind of a transition point, I think, in, in when you started into that. What start, What was your, ignited your passion for entrepreneurship or what's the what's the driving force behind that for you? What was the first one? Was it was it Apollo to start? Apollo to start, yeah. yeah. I think I think all the goal setting mm -hmm. and, and working through getting finished with my athletics goal setting and um, working through Music is more of a passion love thing that I, I love music, but it's not really like I set a goal to, to do for music. Yeah. So I needed something else. In 1999, I opened the Apollo Clinic in Abbotsford, and um, I my whole goal was to help 50 people a week. I have it written on a little piece of paper in my wallet when I all through those years, and I did. I worked with with like 50 patients at, on average every week. Um, 
when I opened the Apollo, then the goal changed. Okay, now I want 150. So I hired two other people to work with me. Then we were reaching 150 people. And it's just exponentially grown to now we're seeing like 4,000 patients a month between both clinics. And my other business is helping people from all over. So the new goal is 100,000 people every year that we reach out to is, yeah. is the new goal. With P3. With P3. Right. Okay. But the clinic was the beginning stage in 99 and um, worked at in the Abbas Free Clinic until, um, well, it's still there. Yeah. I'm not working with patients anymore. Um, but opened the Chilliwack Clinic in 2019. So one of the, your entrepreneurial ventures was the development of a product called Core Shorts, oh. and which Under Armour ultimately bought. So tell us a bit about that. I got to give all the credit to to Greg Bay, who yeah. who is the creator of Core Shorts, and um, I was a helper, uh, definitely a helper with Greg and. They're awesome. Uh, core shorts are, are basically a pelvic stability bracing system for active people. You throw them on if you've if you maybe you've tweaked a groin or have a sore SI joint, and and then you just have uh, more stability to go and, and play your game. Mm -hmm. And it was just a brilliant idea, and picked up by Under Armour. Um, and now I'm thankful to say that it's back with Greg. Okay. Uh, so he has control of it again, yeah. and you can look him up. It's core shorts. Uh, um, what are they, they're calling it like 1.0, 2.0, 3.0 kind right. of idea. Yeah. 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 I don't want to go back too far, but um, one thing I think is interesting or was for me, I played a lot of sports uh, and then there was the transition and, and injuries and then the transition from, okay, I'm not going to be a professional athlete and this isn't going to be my future forever. Yeah. Now I need to transition into something else and, and sort of that that transition um did you find that difficult as well or, or how did you move through mm -hmm. being at like an athlete to being an entrepreneur oh i guess that would have been what i would probably say i understood what depression was for the, for that time of injury when i was injured in 1990. So when you missed the, the pan am games or which? uh yeah so i actually um i, I ruptured a ligament in my ankle as well as the groin injury that was the groin injury was like a two month thing. It was nothing, but yeah. the ankle was the put me out of the big games. Um, and I also had, I had a, like tons of scholarships. So I, I, it wasn't the scholarship. It was the expectations of others on me. So I had letters from coaches all over North America saying, why aren't you doing that? Why aren't you competing? Why aren't you carrying on? Um, but I also I also had the realization, and I don't know if someone told me this, but you're not going to make it a career um, in my sport. Like there there are no hammer throwers unless you come from like Ukraine, yeah. or Russia, who are incredible athletes. Who you know Estonia, the guy comes out and he's probably making a million dollars a year, sure, because he's the world champ. But if you're like hunt number 130 in the world it doesn't matter if you're number 130 in the world in hockey it's a big difference yeah, yeah right yeah, sure uh, you're making millions. yeah so i think that the reality um and your sport what was your baseball that's what i thought yeah um totally different right you could go on and and there is an option there to maybe have a career um if you have that coaching and you know you don't have the injuries if you survive that was a big thing being a therapist after with all these young athletes it was really survival I remember talking to Pavel Burry about that and he he was saying hey there were lots of guys better than me it's just that I survived and then he didn't right and mm -hmm. then, then he then he hurt himself so yeah. it really does come through that and that's what I love trying to help these guys survive and that was my role I got to play but I went through a uh, rough time of trying to figure out what I was going to do. Yeah. And I, my, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, I, I, yeah, I remember having a similar sort of experience. Uh, it wasn't a rupture, but it was my, I had a serious sciatic injury and I was uh, trying to make the, the team Canada and, and it was, we were in tryouts and I came back early from a sciatic injury to, to compete for the team. And then, uh, yeah, went out again and I was out for like probably another six months. And I just remember missing all of that. And then, you know, all your friends and stuff going to it and just sort of the experiences that you missed out on. And yeah, it was a tough time. And, and then it's kind of when I had the, yeah. you know, epiphany where you're like, man, maybe my body's not going to take care of me forever. I'm going to have to, uh, you know, switch professions or, or start thinking about something else. I remember sitting in the, I got a job the, the day I met my wife actually, and I'm at the bar waiting for my 
interview and I open the paper and I'm reading all the results of all of my Canadian team mates in Atlanta at that, at that time. But that was the transition to, I met this amazing woman. I now moved on to have a family and a career. And so there was this changeover and it was okay. Yeah. And, but I, I'll never forget the moment either. And, which is and, probably what you went through as and well. And how much do you attribute your success in the entrepreneurship and, and to, to your, you know, growing up in, in that in that kind of life? A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. My dad told told my sister once that I'll be okay because I'm just a, I'm just weird enough. We're all just weird enough. If we're if we're driven to invest it all, risk it all, your body, your money, whatever. You're, you're not many. There's very few people who will do that, right? And I love it. That's the most fun. What do you love about it? I don't want to gamble, but I want to invest in me. I want. Yeah. Uh, I invest that I'm going to show up tomorrow. I'm yeah. not going to invest someone else is going to show up, yeah. but I'll invest that I will show up. One of the topics I had wanted to talk to you about, and this might fit well now, is, you know, I've talked about this, the, the, I guess the concept of how to have a good life, mm. how to be happy. What does purpose and meaning mean in life? And and I think it's tied in a bit, at least, to what we were just talking about. But tell me about your philosophy as far as that goes. Well, I, th- I think if... You, if I, I kind of believe in trying to find the successes in all things, um, whether it's, it's relationship, uh, spiritual, money, um, business, but that falls into that. But it's not just business and money, business and relationships and mm-hmm. outside of your family and and living and living that most successful life I can live. Um, and then I think that I help others live their successful lives. And mm-hmm. I like mentoring and trying to be successful in helping others. Yeah. It's always kind of my mantra. And I think if I do that enough, then I will be good. Um and I've always, I've, I've always believed that. I think my watch my dad do that. I just, I think that that's a, something that's in my core belief. One of the things I've found in my own experience of this, and I, I think might resonate with you, but, um, I found I had this huge goal to get a judgment over a million dollars and not many lawyers ever achieve that. Like after a trial result and it, I worked really hard for many years to get that and I obtained it and I was, I thought I'd have this elation and this super high and I was pretty happy for about a day or two. And then, then I was like, okay, that's faded. And then I was like looking for the next hill to climb. And, and that seems like a bit of a story of your life. You're always looking for that next hill to climb. And what I realized about myself is I love the process of climbing the hill more than the end result. Absolutely. The end result is like, it's the goal and you got there and it's like, but it's actually the process of getting to the goal is what makes me happy. A hundred percent. Oh, and the yeah. hardship and the adventure of it. Oh, yeah. And when you look back, even the sad parts and the hard parts, like even the not making it, look what you're doing today. Yeah. If you had made it, you could have been, you know, sitting in a bullpen. Warming somebody up. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Not the guy on the field. Like, yeah. and, and, and that would have held with it some didn't make my goal. Yeah. But. You know, I, I totally agree with you. It's it's that climb. Um, I don't like climbing. <laughs> Let's be clear. <laughs> the metaphorical climb. Yeah. The metaphorical climb. I, I, yeah. What do you like about it? Like what it, what it, what is it um, about it that that gets you going? I think I think work. I like work. Yeah. I like I like just do the work. I, I I'm 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 the guy. If if you said I need a hole dug. I'll get a shovel and dig the hole. Yeah. I'm not going to talk about the hole. Right. <laughs> like, you'll tell me the dimensions, but I'm just going to do it. And and I think that taking action is what I love. Yeah. I don't like, I like planning, but then I like executing the plan. I want to mm-hmm. get to that fast. Yeah. Does that make you happy? Yes. Yeah. 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 For sure. hundred percent. And being healthy makes me happy. Yeah. I think. And so part of my the journey is a journey of human biology as well and, mm-hmm. and staying healthy. And when I've had the down times, I'm not in that good place to do anything. Yeah. So if I'm not maintaining my health, 
so this has been a this was a connection point for us over many years is yes. working out together and yeah. so I well it's a, it's a, a lot of story fun. of how we met actually <laughs> go ahead. I tell that yes story? yes okay. for sure this is my this is like your growing splits moment this is my <laughs> this is your perception <laughs> of how we met yeah well we had met one time earlier at a golf yes, tournament briefly right. and then we were at this uh, legal medical legal conference in Mexico and uh, it's the first day and Jamaica Jamaica sorry Jamaica yeah and so I see you on the pool deck and I'm like I recognize you and you're from Greendale and I'm from Chilliwack so we connect and uh, and I have this disease it's called first night itis <laughs> <laughs> and whenever I go on vacation or I go anywhere I tend to imbibe a little more I'm just so exuberant yeah. and excited about the, you're the a moment lot of fun. <laughs> and so at some point during that night um, I had my shirt off and I was riding your back down the hallway in the hotel. That's correct. <laughs> and uh, through the lobby, <laughs> through the lobby, and to the, to the nightclub. One of my favorite parts of that story is there was this neurologist at the conference, and he's an older guy, and he right. pulled you aside and he said, "John, you got to stay away from that guy. He's trouble." <laughs> I think he may have even said it while you were on my back. <laughs> 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 so from there has developed a beautiful friendship. Absolutely. But, but uh, one of our, our real connection points, apart from having fun, but it was yeah. we worked out a lot together. And, and you helped me enormously in terms of actual technical skill in powerlifting and in ter- CrossFit and all those things. So and me being about 100 pounds lighter than you, but I, I, I can hold my own oh, too. Oh, yeah. Bad it, too, so. it was fantastic. It, we, we actually started working out in Jamaica. We both yeah, had this. Right. We had a discussion. And I said, well, how about 3 o'clock every day? And he yeah. said, absolutely. Yeah. And I knew then that you were able, you were willing to take action yeah. on, on, on a suggestion of something that was to better yourself absolutely. every day. And yeah. I, getting better every day is one of my other mantras huh. in something. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe it's my guitar, maybe it's my piano, maybe it's the gym. Yeah. Maybe it, it's. It sounds like it's not just about you being healthy and, and about you, but also helping other people be healthy or, I mean, obviously uh, with the athletes, uh, you know, helping them survive through their career or, you know, getting Luke in the gym at three o'clock or helping people uh, at the Apollo Clinic or, I mean, developing P3. I mean, all these things are, are really to help other people as well. And you seem to drive a lot of uh, happiness from that as well. It's the purpose that's written on our board at work. Yeah, it's, it's you know, helping people get back to the activities they love and and that's the whole thing because if everybody's having a good time in the room it's a fun room like when he gets in the room it's a fun room sometimes (laughs) most of the time well let's say yeah when we're after work yeah Yeah. Yeah. but but it really it it is and and you drew me to you as well and and i think the fact that i threw the three o'clock in there because i don't know if you remember but it usually would rain in jamaica around three and it wouldn't let us drink until after three. Then. That's right. So we 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 made sure we didn't imbibe, and we went to the gym and we had great conversation and we had a lot of fun, and you got pumped up, you know, <laughs> <laughs> right? Absolutely, <laughs> it was fun. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so yeah, that's one thing I've really enjoyed about our, our relationship. And so eventually you built a gym at your own house and I yes. spent many a days working out in your gym and, uh, getting the tunes going and, and just cranking out, uh, Bruce Springsteen, lots, lots yeah. of, <laughs> lots well, of power. Lift. Yeah. We throw a little bit more nickel back <laughs> on yeah, in there, yeah. maybe <laughs> Metallica. Uh, but so what, you talked a bit about this, but like, there's a real technical aspect to weightlifting and it's something you actually help me a lot with and, yeah. and walk me through that for you in terms of being one of your passions? Well, I think that uh, being coached as, yeah. a, as a kid and learning properly how to lift and then uh, supporting that through understanding the human movement, the study of human movement through kinesiology and then through injury as well, um, it's so important. And I used to go in the gym and I have no problem because I, I don't, I don't like to think about ego in lifting. It's, it's more about safety. Yeah. And so if I'm in the gym and I see someone potentially going to hurt themselves, I will walk up and say, excuse me, I I own a clinic and I don't want to see you in that clinic. So do you mind if I just get your hips in this position so you don't hurt your multifidus? And I'll give them a definition, a description that's that's medical. I'm not going to be some weird, creepy guy in the gym, but I want them to understand why I'm suggesting it. Mm -hmm. And then you get stronger yeah, and then your lifts go up and then you're happier. And, and so helping people technically do things properly, you know, clean and jerk properly, squat properly, deadlift properly. It is a lot of fun. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. 
So coming back to entrepreneurship, one of the your, your main businesses now we haven't even talked about yet, which is P3. So P3 is yeah. an analgesic cream, which is for treatment of injuries. And tell me a bit about how you developed that and, and what your what your passion is for that. I imagine there was a struggle up the hill of getting that to market and getting it going. And oh, yeah. Well, you know, it, it was actually, no, there was actually a demand for it because... Um, it, this goes back to music again. I actually, uh, this, the story is I had a friend in music who was selling a product that was used in the dairy industry that was for mastitis for cows. So my scientific brain says, okay, well, it works on tissue for inflammation. So tissue's tissue. And then he said, well, you should use it on all your athletes. I said, I'm not using an udder cream on my athletes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so he convinced me to try it with a few people. And those few people said, hey, where can I get that? So I thought, oh. Well, that's interesting. So we worked with this product to make it into what P3 is today. We had it was quite pilly and dry, and so we've we've made it into uh, the use on human skin and for treatment. Um, that was back in 2007. I worked with a, a scientist on that, and then I reformulated it in. Oh my goodness, uh, 2000 and. 14 ish. Um, and it's, that's what it is still today. And the reason it wasn't a, a huge, a uh, huge problem is I used it every day in the clinic. So my hands put it on 10 people, the 15 people working with me, put it on 10 people. So before you know it, every day we're introducing, you know, hundreds of people to this, then a friend's clinic wants to use it. So now they're introducing it. Next thing you know, we go to Save On Foods. They're happy to take it on. Um, it, it kept growing. Now, we didn't really focus on the sales until three years ago. We've started. And it's exploding. Absolutely. So we're on Amazon, uh, Shopify. Um, we're in about 1,000 stores and clinics across Canada. And we have yet to market properly. We just hired a marketing company. We just started, finished our first month of SEO building. Like it's literally climbing right now. Um, super exciting. I just, I have a new partner who I love. He's a, um, a childhood family friend. He's like a big brother to me. And he just joined me. He's, he's a world of experience in that industry. So this is a, the new journey, the new goal setting. So I've got new things for the vision board, new things to think about. Um, and it's not all just money. It's more helping people. And the amount of testimonials we get back uh, is incredible. And the latest thing I just thought of the other day is what I want to do is I want to open up a, an appointment schedule where I can answer questions because all of these people are having a hard time getting in to see someone, doctors and physios and whatnot. So they want an ear sometimes. So if I can give them a 10-minute ear for free, well, why not? I love that. Yeah. So we're looking into that. And, mm -hmm. and we have these, you know, we have thousands of emails that we send out to on newsletters and whatnot. So those people that are interested in looking for some help with a shoulder or a knee or a headache, or yeah. if I can lend some help, and usually it's a referral onto the right person in their town, then we'll do that. But they all use the product, which is really cool. Yeah. So. I, I've used P3. It's an amazing product. How, how, how would you say it's different than other sort of topical and mm. sort of creams? Great question. It, it doesn't have methyl salicylate in it, which is uh, an aspirin derivative. And so go back to 2007, w there was a young lady in New York State who was a track athlete who unfortunately passed away from poisoning of methyl salicylate, according to the coroner's report. Uh, so all of us sports therapists immediately said, okay, no more using this stuff. And it wasn't one product. It was one product she was using, but we, we didn't want to use any product that had methyl salicylate. And then as a liability, which you guys totally understand uh, from a professional standpoint, I had to tell all my colleagues, hey, you can't use this stuff because mm -hmm. if someone's on a heart medication and you're giving them a blood thinner, what's going to happen? We don't know if it mm -hmm. could hurt them, if it, but if it does, that's very bad. So from a professional standpoint, um, I said, let's come up with this natural product. And we did. And so that's the biggest thing for me. But it smells good. Yeah. The, the, what's the tagline that one of my colleagues who was in Jamaica with us, yeah. Parm, said... Uh, um, 
smells like Christmas, feels like heaven. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good line. You have a, you have a, you have a lavender line as well, don't yes, you? Yes, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. And is that from your Greendale lavender as well? So we planted a lavender field yeah. and we started a lavender line. Yeah. And I've used that one. That yeah. I brought you some. There's yeah. some in the, oh. in the bag there. So, yeah. I love that smell too. Yeah. Um, the, and that was just... Honestly, that was me and my little mad scientists. I have a little area that's like my science area, and I was just mixing different essential oils to see what what it would smell like. And lavender and peppermint and eucalyptus smell great together, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so we now also have NPNs. We have natural product numbers from from Health Canada for all our products, and uh, we're you know we're good to go. Whereas a lot of products, um, they don't. And so I do I do recommend. Well, you have to now to sell in Canada properly. But we've jumped through all those hoops and made sure that our product is safe for the public, which is kind of that mandated key thing for us to do. Yeah. One of the one of the transitions in your life, and I, I think transition points are always really interesting because it's kind of when we get tested in our resilience and who we are and kind of where we're going to go. And so, you know, you had an injury with that you were dealing with, which caused you to not be able to continue on as a therapist. And that must have been a tough transition for you. So walk me through what that looked like and how did you, I guess, reinvent yourself at that point in your life? Yeah, I, th- I think that... Um there was a lot going on in our lives at that point. And my wife was the one that said, you need to stop. Mm-hmm. Like I couldn't, basically what had happened is I had um, flattened out the curve of my C-spine by looking down for 28 years, eight hours a day at people basically. And um, even through all the weightlifting and everything, now, go back. Being a thrower of heavy implements is probably didn't help me in my yeah. extension of my neck because yeah. one of the things with hammer was you fully extend and pull really hard. So to this day, I'm dealing with um, ongoing neck issues. I just wrote a blog for our our web page about how to deal with a sore neck when you're traveling because I literally was just traveling with a sore neck. Yeah. And so I have things I do every day, and I wanted to share that with people. And I have exercises I do, and I use... P3 and I use ice and I, I sleep on a certain pillow and I do all these things. But um, it, it got to a point where I couldn't, I couldn't sleep. So then, you know, your sleep is interrupted. Yeah. Then you try and go to work and, and it was just getting harder and harder and harder. And I was not doing, I was doing so poorly that my wife had to say, stop. Mm-hmm. And if you look back at my schedule in 2018, you see it looks good and then it starts to dwindle and then it starts to black out certain days because I just had to start canceling. I couldn't, yeah. I couldn't do it, which I'm not good at giving up. I'm not good at relinquishing right. my position in anything, but I also have to maintain some intelligence. I, yeah. I can't just, if, if I'm hurt, how can I help others? Right. But I think another thing that must've been tough for this, for you and will correct me if I'm wrong, but I, you have a real gift for healing. Like, and mm. you've treated me before and you have a real gift for it. You have a knack. It's not just the physical movements. It's the interaction with the patient. It's all those things. And I think you have a real passion for that. And so that must've been hard to not do that on a daily basis. Thank you. And super hard. Yeah. I, I love helping people. I love the mm. result of them saying, um, you know, one of the most fun people I treated was a rock star and I won't say who it was, but <laughs> who it, lives in Abbotsford. Uh, no, well, maybe <laughs> not anymore. Okay. Uh, but he, he was at the stage of life where he wanted to be doing workouts in the gym and he was doing pull-ups and he couldn't do pull-ups cause he hurt his shoulder. He got my name. I stayed late for him. We worked on it. I worked on him three times and then he texted me. He said, I don't know what you did, but I'm like better. And I said, well, you only better temporarily. Like you have to now change how you're doing your pull-ups. Yeah. And we talked about all that stuff. But the, I love that. I love helping him. It's yeah. not the winning. It's the being able to help somebody. It's the satisfaction yeah. of changing someone's life and, and creating a good outcome for them. Yeah. I mean, so I, I do miss treating yeah, people. I bet. hundred percent. I mean, like for, I think for Brian and I, that's a huge part of why we do what we do. And to lose that, I can't imagine that. Exactly. So how did, how did you work through that transition? Um, that was another, so there would have been two big hurdles in my life. One would have, would have been when I was injured out of sport. Yeah. And the next would have been when I was injured out of work. Yeah. And 
But then I was able to turn my view towards running the clinic, growing the clinic to help more people. Right. If I if I kept to that core belief of helping more people, well, then it works, right? So yeah. we went from, at that point, we went from helping, uh, I think we were 1,000 people a month to now we're doing, like I said, 4,000 people right. a month of, of patients in the clinics. So that was my goal was to grow it that way. Yeah. And you love mentoring and giving back. And so, I mean, you have, yeah. you have a team that you've mentored and shown all these things. And so by, by extension, you know, John's one set of hands is now. Exactly. Right. That's exactly what it is. It's, it's basically 50 other people working at those places to help others. Yeah. And, and it's not all because of me. It's because of all of them as well and working together. Like you say, there always has to be someone who tells you which trail to take up the hill. Yeah. Someone, you know, very few people forge their own path, which I guess I kind of did in a sense. I didn't have the specific mentorship of people telling me what to do, uh, especially in business. That was crazy. But um, I'm happy to have done that. And now it, I think I told you once, I feel like I'm the old guy on top of the hill helping people up to yeah. the peak, right? Yeah. And because I feel like I'm, I'm on that, yeah. and I'm, but I'm not finished. I'm just on that one. Uh, and now I've got another one I'm working on. Right? <laughs> so actually talk about that's a, maybe a good transition point. And this is, a, I know this is a topic that was has been a challenge for you is like your dad's passing and mm -hmm. kind of how much of an influence he was on your life and, and the, the journey through that process for you. And so why don't you walk us through that? Well, that's like, you know, that's like the, one of the hardest things that we ever go through in life. And, um, but he also taught, he taught all of us in the room how to die with grace. Mm -hmm. Like, holy crow, this guy was amazing. Um, I, I didn't have these, uh, it's not like a storybook relationship where you've got the dads of today. Yeah. The dad I am, very different than the dad my dad was. But I wouldn't give up that guy at all. He was perfect for me. I didn't need me. I needed him. So now they got me, which is very different. Yeah. We chat more, yeah. hug more, yeah. you know, we do those things more. But, but your dad was an RCP officer as well. He okay. was, <clears throat> he was a, he had, he had like nine careers. Yeah. Yeah. He went through them all. Um, I think foremost, he was honest and he was hardworking mm -hmm. and there was, there was no, I don't know. He never... I never, I never was spanked by my father, mm -hmm. never hit by my father. None of those things that people like to talk about from the 80s and the 70s. None of that. But you definitely did not mess with that man. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that that was important for me. Yeah. 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 It taught me really great values. And um, it, he went too early. Mm -hmm. But now when I see my mom, I don't want, I wouldn't have wanted to see him like this. Yeah. Yeah. So selfishly, right. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. And he was still with it mentally. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. yeah. So coming back to this transition you've been going through for the last few years from no longer treating people to, you know, developing in the clinic and, and mm -hmm. blowing up P3, like what's next for John? Like where, where does this go? <laughs> well, I think our goal honestly is to, is to build P3 over the next five years. We have a five year goal and it's, it's a, a big, high area, audacious goal, right? Like it, that, it, the yeah. bag, the that's bag, as, yeah. as all of yours have been. Uh, well, they all yes. are. Yeah. Um, and I love the fact that I have a new partner who isn't reining me in. He's pushing me further. And that's what a coach used to do for me. Yeah, and yeah. I, and so I live in that environment really well. I, I, don't, I don't like being reined in. You don't like being reined in. We like being let go. Yeah. To Empowered. Me. Just go. Just do it. Yeah. Yeah. And so. Direct it, though. Yeah. <laughs> Slightly. <laughs> <laughs> We're like those wild horses that yeah. just, just run. But you're like, you're like yeah. go that way. <laughs> <laughs> just don't break your leg in the process. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and they don't all, it doesn't always work, does it? You know, sometimes we have to stumble a little bit. Of but, course. But. Put yourself what's off and next? keep going. Yeah. 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 So, it's, so it's the climb. It's, a five, it's another five-year climb. Five so what do I do? What's next? I, I had... 
I was stuck in a bit of a hole for a while till till this goal for P3 is set. So what did I do? And I think that that when I reflect on myself, it's super important to think about this. Last year, I I wasn't able to set these goals yet, so I went and took piano lessons. Yeah, I'm like, oh yeah, baby, I'm playing this stuff. I'm not going to be held back from. I want to sit down and want you to go. Wow, that's what I want. Yeah, I, I want to surprise my friends. I want yeah. to, and and so that was great. I, I totally. People say to me all the time, "I want my kid to play piano." I said, "Well, do you play piano?" <laughs> no. Well, then you should. <laughs> if you want your kid to do it, then you should probably do it. Yeah. And I think that I take my own advice there. It's like whatever I ask others to do, I'm willing to lead by it. example. Yeah, give yeah. it a try. I'm playing pool again. Yeah. So that's keeping me really busy. Yeah. I played at a professional level back in the 90s, and I'd like to try to go in some tournaments again before mm-hmm. my eyes fail too much. <laughs> You're not that old. So come on. <laughs> but, but the eyes. Nine ball or billiards? I or? played nine ball professionally, and yeah. I played eight ball in turn- a lot of yeah. tournaments. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I'm playing a lot of eight ball right now yeah. just to get back. I have uh, one good friend who's, who's an excellent player who's helping me kind of get back into it. And yeah. You've got that beautiful pool table. At your I, house do. In the- I bought that back in the day for specifically training. Yeah. Yeah. For those nine ball tournaments. And so one of the other passions you have is farming and you have this farm oh. in Greendale and uh, Brian mentioned the lavender. You have these beautiful lavender fields. People come and take pictures in mm-hmm. them and, but you put it in the P3 product. Um, Walk me through the the interest in farming and and that part of your life. Well, I I wanted to comply with our beautiful city of Chilliwack. And um, they said, if you want to use your barn for your um, little store and warehouse, then you need to plant a product that you sell. Yeah. So that's what started us on Lavender, and that's what moved us to the Lavender Com uh, P3. And um, really, uh, my wife is doing the majority of that now. Yeah. I, I helped get everything set up. We planted together. We did it all. We planted them all, 1,000 plants ourselves. Yeah. And um, unfortunately, in the floods two years ago, we lost 300. That one field was full of water. So mm-hmm. um, we've this spring, we replanted another. I think she finished. I didn't do the last 60. I think she did those on her own. So I can't take a lot of credit for, yeah. for everything. Um, I, I grew up on a farm. And so being on a farm is pretty important to me yeah yeah Yeah. what does john retire ever oh no what is what does it look like for you then um so goals so one day when i sell p3 i think i'm going to help other people yeah i'm going to mentor and i want to i want to help them do what i did in terms of in business or in yeah, other areas, probably as well. business. Yeah, okay. probably say because, as you guys know, um, there are often things where you go, "Oh, I wish I could just ask somebody that question," but nobody has the answer that yeah. you may know right now. Yeah. Often, you have to get a consultant or you have to look into who would answer that, and and often the answers are vague and they're not. I would I would rather be philanthropically uh, philanthropically helpful yeah. uh, than just be a vague consultant. Right. You know, I'd rather uh, put it out there to say, hey, I did this and this is what I did. I hope it would help with what you're doing. So business has many components, Um, you know, everything from accounting to marketing to uh, managing employees to setting goals, everything and and having a vision. And so I don't see you as like the accounting guy. That's not going to (laughs) be your business, which part of business is, is really your passion in your heart that you get fired up about. I think finding the right people. Um, to do those jobs is really important, and that's what I would push. Because yeah. too many entrepreneurs do everything, right? Which I did for a long time. Yeah. So, finding that person that does all your IT and your marketing and your accounting, um, that getting that figured out first, and usually that takes money, mm-hmm. and that's the big the big the hurdle level before you can exactly right. Yeah. So, I think it's important to learn it all, so then you can understand how to deal with. Um, those hurdles as they come, but what what would be mine? Mine would be the the visioning, goal setting, and an, and then action planning. Right. I think steps to, yeah. and then I'm a bit of a cheerleader. I think yeah. you know I I I, I, don't, I don't believe that you can't do something. Yeah. You know, maybe if you said to me, "I want to I want to deadlift a thousand pounds," I'd say, "Well, that's just stupid." Yeah. yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's it's like. Your okay. third hip one, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Right. Uh, but I think if you have a, a goal that is um, attainable, 
yeah. then you should do it. Yeah. Yeah. So one of uh, stories uh, you and I went with our uh, our wives to Mexico a number of years ago, and and you introduced this book to me called Good to Great, and I read it on the beach, and I just I, I couldn't stop reading it, I couldn't put it down, and uh, I learned a lot of lessons from that book that I still incorporate today, and it's one of the two top business books I've ever read. And so you you mentioned one of the concepts there, and I remember like there's five lessons to be what, a level five leader and yeah. and those types of things. So um, right person on the bus, bus right spot on the bus and and that's kind of what you're talking about to some degree exactly and and sometimes i have to be reminded of of that because i do i love people so much i have a hard time you know moving them around maybe um but that book was the first good the first best business book i've read i I guess i should say um and that's why i shared it with you yeah. I've got a whole bunch of other ones. I, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I moved. I moved into into biology, health more yeah, than yeah. anything. But um, uh, yeah, it, it was. One of the other lessons from that book, and you have demonstrated that through our interview today, and it's something I just love about you as a person, is uh, it's uh, when things go wrong, great leaders look in the mirror. When things go right, they look out the window and give credit to everyone else. And I I see you, you know, you talk about your team and give credit mm-hmm. to others, and I th- think that's such an important concept. It's in, in life, in athletics, in, mm-hmm. in any type of relationship, in business specifically as well. But uh, tell me a bit about that philosophy and kind of how you developed that. Oh, well, that's that's one hundred percent true. Um, if if you uh, if you're blaming others for for the team's misfortune, you're not a team player. Yeah. Uh, well, if you're at the top, it's kind of your fault. It really is. <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely. And 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 even if it's even if it's not your fault, you take the responsibility exactly. for that yeah, fault. Exactly. Like, um, it, and you move on, mm-hmm. and you give people that extra chance to to rectify the situation. Yeah. Yeah. I, I 100% agree with that, those, uh, those quotes. Um, I would say celebrating is the best part of it, yeah. you know, obviously, um, and, and it should be done more often. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I, I used to say, all I want to do is have fun. And that's what it means. Yeah. And be successful and have fun. Yeah. Celebrate the successes. I, I think one of the other uh, concepts, and I've been listening to podcasts about this, is and I just, I resonate so much with this concept is the sense of adventure that you have when you take something on and you're out there and you're just taking a risk and setting a goal that, you know, other people might think is unattainable. And it's the adventure of that. And adventures are not just fun adventures. There's hardship in adventure. There's days where it's like, why the heck did I do this? (laughs) And I can't sleep at night because I'm worried about X, Y, or Z. Right. But then it's the overcoming of those hardships that I think is, gives a real satisfaction and you look back on that adventure that you experienced and think, man, that was amazing. And the hardship and, and, and both overcoming, they're both yeah, for sure. Great. Oh yeah. I have a great example is we were just in uh, Santorini and my wife wanted to do a hike and I had, was just getting over a knee injury and I, d- I don't like hiking anyway. Yeah, and as I was, you've mentioned. as I've mentioned, <laughs> and I had this knee injury and I knew that I probably shouldn't do the 10 K from Fira to Ia, yeah. and you should definitely do it if you ever go there. Yeah. Um, but I said to myself, stop being selfish and just do this for her. And so uh, we did it. And she thought I was going to bow out at one point, but I didn't, I wasn't going to. And we did this hike. So it's nothing crazy. Not, it's not some huge goal, but it was just getting through 10K, limping through yeah. 10K. Yeah. Um, and making sure that I, I was telling myself that I'm not doing it for me. But then in the end, it was for me. Yeah. That is yeah. fantastic. Like yeah. you say, the heart, like I look back at that. I'm so glad we did it. Yeah. yeah. Now that we did it. The, the other thing I really, I, I love about that is when you find like minded people and you kind of, it's like you and I bounce ideas off each other. And it's yeah. just that, but it's that like sense of, you know, you're on an adventure together and you got a person who's cheering you on and, you know, I'm cheering you on. And it's like, yeah. I, I love the camaraderie. I think would be the right word that comes from that experience. I don't think there's anything better than like, if you were to phone me and say, Hey, congrats on that. Or I heard you're doing this or go do that or, yeah. or give support from someone that you trust. 
uh, there's not much better than that. That's why we love coaching, right? I'm sure you had that in baseball where you get some good coach who supports you and then you just, it fills you up, right? Absolutely. So, it gives you the, the energy to do the next thing. So the, the next topic I wanted to talk about is your, you have your own podcast. So I haven't even heard it yet. So you just told me the well, other day. So I, I would like to. I was on one. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it I, wasn't mine. Yeah, okay, it's not yeah. mine. No, um, I, I, uh, I had a. I was on with uh, the, uh, this Commerce Life. They're called, and yeah. they had me on for P three. And those guys right. are great. Yeah, Phil and Kenny, and and um, I would I would like to do that one day. But um, you're really good at this. You guys do a great job, and I don't I don't want to get into a, a new thing that I may not be great at right. yet. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you'd be great at anything. <laughs> I can do anything. <laughs> Maybe I don't want to do it. Yeah. Yet. <laughs> I'll play some music for you instead. Right, I yeah. like that. Yeah. Well, I think I'm coming to the end of the questions yeah. I had for you. It's been a great, a great uh, talk wow. today, John. I, I really appreciate you guys having me in, and I'm so grateful and, and uh, glad that you guys are working together. And I've, I've kind of been around since that started, and I'm proud of you both. And, and I'm happy with all the results you guys produce that I get to hear about, not from you, yeah. but from others. And uh, I'm just proud to, uh, to be friends. Well, thanks, Absolutely. John. Absolutely, yeah. No, it's thanks great. Thanks so much. Thanks, John. It's so good to see you again. Yeah, it's great yeah. to see you too. You're watching The Luke Bryan Show.